Shirk Maitsky, Shirk Skripa, Tatsmewi, Ineshwasa Sawipam. Good morning. Good morning. Sawipam is the name my grandmother gave me when I was 13. It doesn't translate, actually. It has something to do with people coming out of a very cold place. It references back to a time when glaciers were melting and the planet was flooding in this region. It's an old name. I'm here today to talk to you about something that is very personal, but also very public because of the work I do. About a hundred years ago, my grandmother stood on the banks of a river in what is now the Umatilla Reservation with her father, singing yo my, yo my, yo my to the crawdads, calling them from up the river and down the river. Her father told her, if you gather them, you have to feed them. It's a good rule. It might result in fewer meetings. Like Mianashma, our children around the world, she was being taught how to live in this place we call home. She was taught some very simple lessons that have application for all of us. Naknuitanam, take care of your body. Take care of each other. Do each other no harm. Take only what you need. Bears eat berries, birds eat berries. You are not the only consumer of those luscious huckleberries. In our culture, plants speak their names to us. If you've ever eaten huckleberries, especially when they're really tart, you would understand why they're called wimnu. These languages that are thousands and thousands of years old came from the land. If we let them die, they have a chance to have that happen again. They could come back to us. <clears throat> but one of the other lessons we've learned from living here for thousands of years in this region that we so love is that all things must be in balance. Man and woman, day and night, good and bad, abundance and scarcity. We learn from it all. We learn especially when things are out of balance. When things are out of balance, there tends to be more scarcity or more scarcity for some and none for others. When things are out of balance, there's a little too much testosterone in the room, you can tell, or a little too much estrogen, you can tell. <coughs> it's important for us to know where the balance is. It's also important for us to know what these languages can teach us. This indigenous culture that I come from, the Columbia River Plateau, is at an enormous crossroads. We are laying to rest the elders who were born as speakers of their languages, not who learned it in classrooms. This generation that is behind me will decide if the languages live or die. You can make a difference to those of us who speak Ichishkin or Nimi Putimki or Kikst, to name a few languages. You don't really have to do anything. In fact, perhaps the best thing you can do is do nothing. Don't take offense. Don't be worried that we're trying to take something from you or that we're criticizing English if we want to hang on to our language and our culture. It's not always about you. One of the reminders that it's not always about us is that we humans don't make the, the earth turn around. We don't make the moon go where it goes or the sun either. We are humble. We are pitiful in our power. But we have enormous capacities. One of the things that it's important for us to understand is that indigenous cultures that are trying to keep their cultures alive to perpetuate the knowledge that we've gained over thousands of years, we're not trying to take anything from anybody and we're also not trying to give it away. 
What we're trying to do is protect an enormous database of ecological information that could benefit all of us. What does language teach us? What do we know because of our languages being alive in this generation? We know where there's condor habitat that the scientists didn't know about. We don't have a word for wilderness in our language. Why is that? Because every place is known. It might be wild, but it's not a wilderness. It's always someone's home. No matter where you are from around the world, you are in an ancient homeland of an indigenous tribe. In your own family, if you look deep enough into your own roots, you are tribal. You may have lost those connections, so you've created new tribes. Nike, ducks, beavers, <laughs> huskies. <laughs> I'm a duck. <clears throat> and a buck, and a bear cat. It's important to consider that we need each other. We need this ancient, ancient database. We need this knowledge, and we have to share it to work together. But in order for us to have access to it, to share it with you, we have to keep it alive. So what? Why does that matter? It doesn't have to. But the culture teaches us something else that we learn in the language. It teaches us that we are not the most important thing. We humans. We are not in charge of the rest of the animal kingdom or the plant kingdom. There's an amazing fact. The most economically deprived areas have the greatest biodiversity in their ecosystem. Why is that? because the Industrial Revolution passed us by. That's good news. But it doesn't mean the Industrial Revolution was bad. It means we need balance, and we need each other. The lessons taught by our languages, by our cultures, by our ancestors in Chichima, are not things that we'll try to turn the clock back to. We are not trying to live in the past as an old culture, we're trying to keep the past alive in a modern time because it has information. The information can only be decoded if we have access to the knowledge from the language. What can you do? As I said earlier, perhaps do nothing. As we try to reclaim indigenous names and put them back on the landscape, don't hate us. Don't oppose us. Watch, listen, learn. We believe the land hears us when we speak in our languages. We believe it hears and feels the prayer songs of our people. That can't be bad. And it doesn't have to be an offense to someone who doesn't understand the language. It is not meant to leave anyone outside. It's meant to protect the place we all now live together. We do it, not just for our individual selves. We do it because, as a previous speaker said, it's our backyard together. We need each other. Scientists, indigenous language speakers, need each other. <clears throat> One of the things that we find is that people tend not to value ancient cultures because we don't value science very much. At least that's what people think. That's not true. Living in a place for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years is empirical. It's longitudinal. It may not be double blind, but if you overhunt something, you know what happens. The consequence is grave for you and your people. If you overpollute, if you overpopulate, which we have done. We have to figure it out. It's not just tribal people. I'm going to teach you a little bit of Ingi our language. Chow. Chow. Means no. E. e. Means yes. Chow, E. Chow. Very easy. Do Indian people have all the answers? Chow. 
Do scientists have all the answers? Can we do it together? Great. See how easy it is? <clears throat> There's not a lot <clears throat> that takes dramatic kinds of thinking to know that roads don't belong in river bottoms, to know that if we don't clean up our own mess, we'll pay for it 15 generations or three generations later. I'm going to ask you one thing, one big, big thing. Live as if your descendants, your descendants, thousands of years from now have to live in your yard. That's all. That's all. And consider when you look at your yard, what other people may have known about that place and still know about that place today. Be humble, show respect, and think longitudinally. Thousands and thousands of years from now, people may be thanking you. Yoko Kolo. <laughs>